And then the Charles Russell Speechley's team will talk to you about the legal requirements, including a focus on investment, uh, commercial contracts, and on IP matters. Um, just bear in mind, we have allowed some time for questions at the end of each presentation or when prompted. Um, if you would like to raise your hands when you want to ask a question or type that question into the chat, then we will keep a track of that and Phil will let us know when there are questions coming in and ask those questions. There shouldn't be any further questions on that. Um, what we'll start with is a brief introduction. So I'll start with myself. It'll say constant sign cost us up there. Uh, maybe my parents call me that. Cos is absolutely fine. Yes. I am a, uh, a part the partner who leads up the London R&D tax incentives team. Uh, my background for my sins is in corporate tax or corporate international tax, uh, but I've specialised in R&D tax incentives for over a decade now. Uh, so working in a wide variety of sectors and with a focus on life sciences. Max, if you don't mind introducing yourself. Thanks, Cos. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. I haven't met. Uh, I'm Max. I'm one of the managers in our Innovations Relief team. I've been at RSM for seven years. Uh, the last three have been focused purely on innovations relief and my background is i've got a degree in pharmacology so my specialism within innovations relief is on life sciences bill if you don't mind introducing yourself yeah uh, hi everybody uh, as um Carl said unfortunately i couldn't be there in person um but i'm i'm not feeling too bad which is good but i thought you wouldn't welcome me passing my my germs around the room um i'm uh, Phil Media, I'm a tax partner in our Cambridge office um, and I um, head up the, the tax side of our life sciences sector group. Um, worked around Cambridge for the best part of 20 odd years now um, and, and that's very much always focused on um, businesses of all shapes and sizes, um, growth businesses right through to aim listed and, and full listing, um, often with a life sciences angle to them and often with an angle which is around uh, expansion into the US. Um, so I used to work out in the US for a few years for your tech business there um, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today, um, expansion into the US and so look forward to that. Perfect, so now we'll move on to Charles Russell's speech please. Caroline? Yes, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Lovely to meet you all and lovely to see some of you on screen. Um, I'm Caroline Young. I'm a partner in the commercial group at Charles Russell Speechley's. I've been there for nearly eight years now. Uh, I specialise in commercial contracts, but with a keen focus on intellectual property, um, commercialising intellectual property, um, high tech engineering manufacturing. And I head up our commercial life sciences sector um, within the firm. And last but not least, Sarah. Hi, thank you. Thanks for having us. Um, I'm Sarah Wigginton. I'm a partner in the corporate team at uh, CRS. Um, I am a, a, a corporate generalist, um, but with a specialism in um, corporate real estate. So that's where I get involved in the um, in the life sciences sector. Um, so lots of joint ventures, investment, investment from every stage, from seed, venture capital, PE, all the way to exit, whether that's trade sale or, or IPO. So that's me. Perfect. Thank you very much, guys. So you now know the team. Uh, I think let's get started with the presentations. So um, just a bit of context for the conversation with regards to R&D tax incentives. The cost of the regime within the UK has dramatically increased over recent years. And with that has come an increase in the abuse of the regime. So what we've seen, first and foremost, is the fact that abuse seems to be rife within the regime. And that's the context for the changes that have taken place. Recent statistics showed that up to 25% of the cost of the regime was on claims which contained some form of fraud or error, which is pretty startling. That's led to the biggest change in the regime since its inception. And those changes are pretty wide ranging. Today, we're going to focus on the changes within the, or that particularly impact the life sciences space. Uh, and I think, broadly speaking, life sciences has been relatively lightly touched with regards to the R&D regime, things like inquiries. What I would say is that means that potentially there's more to do for life sciences businesses than other businesses in terms of getting things up to date in, in terms to meet the requirements that have been set up by HMRC. So the areas we're going to cover today are increased compliance and uh, inquiries. We're going to look at some of the changes that have taken place to the regime, including the changes in rates. And then we're going to touch on some of the cost categories which have changed and what those impacts might be. I'm going to pass over to Max now, who's going to go through a bit of information on the compliance changes. Thanks, Cos. Could we have the next slide, please? So there's three areas I want to talk about primarily when it comes to increased compliance. The new additional information form, the new pre-notification form, and then we'll just have a word on inquiries specifically. So first of all, the new pre-notification form, sorry, the new additional information form. 
up until now, there was actually no requirement to submit any technical justification for your R&D claim. You were able to just put a number into your tax conf and sit back and wait to collect your money. It's not what we would have advised. If you have a material R&D claim, we would have suggested that you submit something to give HMRC some certainty that it was an eligible claim, but it wasn't required. That's all changed from the 8th of August this year. So now, for any R&D claim that's submitted to be accepted, you need to submit your additional information form alongside your CT600. That additional information form is actually quite prescriptive in what they're requiring from you. So first of all, on costs, they're asking that all costs are disclosed by both category and grouped by eligible projects. So for any cost to be claimed, it needs to be assigned to a specific project. The reason that they're asking for that assigning to a project is because they're now prescribing how much technical justification you require. And that's based off the number of eligible projects that you're claiming for. So essentially what they're asking for is, depending on the number of projects you're claiming for, you need to then write up technical narratives that account for projects that cover 50% of your eligible spend. That does vary a bit if you've got a very high or a very low number of projects, but broadly for our clients, it's 50% coverage. As I say, any claims now need to be in line with those regulations and submitting that form. There's also a requirement to submit a pre-notification form for any first-time claimant or anyone who's claiming for the first time in three years. So this is essentially notifying HMRC of your intention to claim. It's got some high-level information in there, you know, high-level information on the type of cost that you're going to be claiming for, the type of activities that you've undertaken, and then some more administrative, administrative information, such as the unique taxpayer reference and the agent that you're going to be preparing your claim with. Once again, if that isn't submitted, and it needs to be submitted within six months at the end of your accounting period, if that isn't submitted, you will lose your ability to claim. So it's something that we're trying to make a lot of noise about and make sure that everyone's aware of. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the in terms of the impacts on life sciences clients, the major impacts that we're seeing are, first of all, this new cost collection requirement. So previously, a lot of life sciences companies have submitted very high level information in terms of their costs because they were seen as a low risk sector and there was no legislative requirement to prepare them in any one particular way. So that means that a lot of our clients aren't collecting cost data on a project by project basis. So a lot of what we're doing is working with those clients to develop methodologies by which they might be able to assign particularly staff time to these specific projects in a way that's going to be compliant with HMRC. There was actually also quite a lot of errors seen in this area when we looked at life sciences claims, a lot of grouping costs into big buckets without any regard for the sort of nature of the cost. So sort of software costs, consumables, subcontractors in one big bucket, because they're treated differently by the regime that was leading to errors. And now that it's going to be under more scrutiny, it's sort of key that it's uh, that we get that right. Secondly, the pre-notification for. So the major area that we see that impacting life sciences is for spin-out companies. But really, if you're setting up any new entity or any entity where you're doing R&D for the first time and hoping to claim, this needs to be at the forefront of your mind. As I said, it needs to be submitted within six months of the end of your accounting period. So that means it's not in line with any of your other corporate tax or financial reporting deadlines. So it's quite easy to miss. So we're really trying to, as I say, make as much noise around that as possible. Uh, increased technical justification. So as I said, HMRC are now requiring a specific number of technical narratives. That's usually higher than what we've seen companies submitting in the past. So it's an increased administrative burden. They're also more prescriptive on the types of details you need to include in those narratives. So previously, they were essentially emphasizing your advance in science or technology and your uncertainty around how you would achieve that advance. There's now some additional areas. So they also want you to define a technological baseline. So what was the current state of knowledge before you undertook your project? And also, how did you re resolve the uncertainties? What sort of activities were you undertaking? So there's essentially more comprehensive information required in this area. The final area, which is particularly key for life sciences, is how are you defining a single project? So this isn't defined in legislation because the legislation applies across all sectors and it's obviously so different for each sector. So that's something that sort of comes down to the judgment of the claimant. But there's certain things you need to factor in when you're making those decisions. If you have sort of specific projects, but they're within a single program of work, which has the same sort of underlying technology, but each project has slight differences, you could group them together and write it up as a single project which would initially seem like a good thing to do because it means you've got less technical narrative to write, less administrative burden on submitting your R&D claim. But what it does mean is that, first of all, there's a cap on the amount of um, benefit that you can receive for a single project. So if you've got this huge costing project that's being rolled forward year after year, you might eventually hit that cap, which will stop you claiming. 
Also, if that project is, if an inquiry is opened by HMRC and they investigate that project and they deem it not to be eligible, you could potentially lose all of those costs. So if you've grouped all of your costs in there, it's essentially a higher risk project. So this is a balancing act and it needs to be viewed on a, on a risk basis, essentially, um, which is something that we'd be able to advise on. Uh, the final point on this slide is that big warning at the bottom. As you can see, 50% of all claims that have been submitted since these regulations came in have been rejected. So that's that alone should tell you this is something that's really worth sort of investing the time in and getting right first time. Uh, next slide, please. So a word on inquiries. So HMRC are currently estimating non-compliance at 50%. So that's essentially saying that of all the claims that are submitted, 50% of them have some form of error in them. We did a bit of digging and found that for life sciences clients, or life sciences claimants, sorry, so with a sick code that falls within life sciences, that's currently running at 51%. So that's broadly representative of life sciences. What we're seeing in terms of inquiries is a significant increase in the free inquiries and also a material change in the way that they're being dealt with. So previously, you might have got an inquiry letter from an inspector, a named inspector, who you could then call, speak to, build some rapport with, and agree on a reasonable way of moving forward. Now HMRC's first recourse seems to be deny the claim outright and ask for all the information that they could possibly ask for. Then when we're replying to HMRC, each letter is essentially being dealt with in a first taxi off the rank methodology. So you won't necessarily be talking to the same person each time. Um, you won't even necessarily have their name. So that whole process is becoming um, much more arduous and less fruitful. And actually, the outcomes that we're seeing from inquiries are much more negative than they have been in the past. So our main message would be that prevention is your defence. Inquiries are costly to defend against. They're usually more they're usually more costly to depend more costly than actually just preparing an R and D claim properly in the first place. So our message is at the moment, as the new regulations are coming in, we would highly recommend that any R and D claim is reviewed by an R and D specialist. Thanks. Thanks. Stop you there. Sorry. Yeah, Question. yeah, of course. Given the breadth of the regime in terms of who it applies to, mm -hmm. and you just saying that it's like first in the rank, like who gets who responds to the questions for for those in the room that are preparing these forms. Who should they have in their mind as the audience of someone who's listening, who's reading it and assessing it? Because is it someone with the technical knowledge that these guys have about what their projects do and everything else and the understanding? Or could it just, is it somebody with no experience in these fields at all? It's slightly conflicted right now. So broadly speaking, they aren't supposed to put themselves forward as the competent professional. So it should be somebody who understands the regime, the, the legislation, the regulations, the guidance around the regime. So you should be aiming at, at a layman with enough technical information that they can understand that there was some complexity involved. That balance is really, really hard to find. Uh, and we are seeing pushback from HMRC when we do provide information that's overly simplified, that it's not complicated enough. But then when we provide information that's too simple, they say that it can't be R&D because it's not complicated enough. Yeah. So it, it's becoming increasingly difficult to find that balance. And just if you mind two seconds, it's just, um, the new team in particular isn't as experienced. So they've they've employed a new volume volume compliance team in essence, and their level of knowledge and understanding of the regime, despite the fact that HMRC says they are trained, means that they're not always best placed to assess whether something is or isn't R and D. So it, it's becoming increasingly challenging, particularly when you get into inquiries. Sorry. Oh, so is that, is that okay for that yeah. question? Can I add two two questions. Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. So uh, first question, you know, Max, you mentioned there's a single project cap. What is that cap? Uh, it's seven, seven and a half million it's euros per pound. Euros. Is that over a period? Three over the life of the project. Life, life of the project. And then the second question is, you know, of the 50% that are actually objected, how many then, you know, how many of those actually then approved or, you know, not actually yeah. We don't have the statistics on it. The, the thing that I would say is... Now more than ever, it's probably important to get your claim in before any impending statutory deadlines. So obviously you've got two years to submit an R&D claim post year end. If you leave it up until the deadline and you submit and it gets rejected for one of the reasons because you've failed something on an administrative issue, then you are at risk of losing that claim. You would hope that HMRC might act sensibly while this new regime is being implemented, but there's no guarantees. You could, you, you could lose the claim altogether. And most companies aren't working two years um, in arrears, but if you are, then there's a significant risk there. So raising the inquiry doesn't stop the clock. The clock continues to run. 
so you put your form in and HMRC say, you know, we've got some questions on this, we're not sure. Does that stop stop running for your two in that? that no, no. So that, that you've still got you've got the ability to run the inquiry and finish that inquiry, even if it's finished your subsequent two years. In terms of um, what Raheem was talking about, I think it's more to do with the submission and whether you meet the submission deadline initially. Right. And if you don't meet that submission deadline or they reject the claim rather than inquiring it because you haven't met the administrative requirements, haven't checked the right boxes or whatever, then you could lose that claim. Gotcha. Um, I think we'll move on yeah. then and do any more questions at the end, just, yeah. just being conscious of time. Sure. Uh, next slide, please. Um, finally, from me, just a word on the new rate changes. So broadly, it's good news for large companies and bad news for small companies. You've got the RDEC rate there jumping from 13% to 20%. So for large companies, the benefit is moving from 10.5p in the pound to 15p in the pound. So good news there. For SMEs, the uplift rate is dropping from 130% to 86%. And the credit rate is dropping from 145 to 10%. So the real pain here is being felt by loss-making SMEs with their benefit dropping from 33p in the pound to 18.6p in the pound. The effect on tax paying SMEs is slightly attenuated by the fact that the corporate tax rate is going up. So their benefit is dropping from 24.7p in the pound to 21.5p in the pound. Just a word on the new R&D intensive rate. So this is something that might be relevant for life science clients, because obviously you're doing, you know, a lot of your focus is on R&D. So the government have come up with this new R&D intensive rate and essentially means if you are R&D intensive, you will get access to that 14.5% old credit rate which means your benefit, if you're a loss-making SME, for example, will drop from 18.6p in the pound back up to 26p in the pound. So it's a really sizable jump and well worth investigating. So what they mean by R&D intensive is that you are spending at least 40% of your total expenditure on eligible R&D. What they're defining as all expenditure is anything that's deductible in your corporate tax return. So that means that it's influenced by things such as capitalization and by timing as well. So if you're aware early that you're close to that 40% boundary, and you can um, alter when you're spending on big projects, whether they be eligible or ineligible to fall in or outside the window, then it's worth bearing in mind because it's a really sizable jump that you can make just by delaying some of those activities. That also needs to be viewed on a group basis. So you need to make sure that you're speaking to all your group companies to make sure that you're not exceeding that 40% uh, boundary. Perfect. Uh, back to you, Cos. Thanks, Max. So I'm now going to go through some of the significant re regime changes that have taken place. Um, the first of which, if you don't mind moving on to the next slide, is to do with the positive changes to the regime. So um, there was a feeling that the R&D regime wasn't keeping pace with technology. So there's always been an ability for companies working in manufacturing, for example, to claim for the consumables and materials used as part of the R&D process. The equivalent for high tech companies quite often is data uh, and is cloud computing costs. So the regime has been changed to, the allow, to allow for the inclusion of these costs, and they can be pretty significant. So things like AWS as your Google Cloud tend to rack up costs very, very quickly. And that there will now be an ability to claim for things like data storage, the software platforms themselves, the operating systems uh, as part of your R&D claim, as well as some of the data costs for data which is being used as part of your R&D process. These costs are going to be includable from a time period or for, for periods which start on or after the 1st of March this year, or 1st of April this year, excuse me. Um, in terms of negative changes, the most significant negative change is the change on the territorial basis for claiming. So in the past, there has been an ability to claim for costs uh, for subcontractors or EPWs or third parties outside of the UK. That will change for accounting periods started on or after the 1st of April 2024. It was going to be 2023, but HMRC uh, allowed a stay of execution so that companies could change their operations, in essence, even if for many companies this is quite complicated to do. Uh, and what that means is that it's going to be much more difficult to claim for costs in a foreign jurisdiction. There are some exemption, exemptions and some caveats which are particularly applicable to the life sciences regime. If you don't mind moving to the next slide. So just in terms of some of the impacts of these changes, I think in terms of the overseas clinical trials, so what HMRC are trying to avoid is costs being incurred in jurisdictions and therefore uh, the exchequer not benefiting from things like PAYE and NIC. Um, but what they have done is they've carved out certain aspects for conditions which don't exist within the UK. Uh, and that's particularly beneficial within the life sciences space. So say, for example, you are looking for USDA approval for a particular product and that need, that testing needs to take place in the US. There is no way you would get the approval otherwise. 
then that would be a valid ground for those costs still being claimable within the UK. And the same goes for things like particular demographics, where there may be uh, a particular demographic that you're looking for that doesn't exist within the UK. Maybe you're looking for uh, particular issues with sickle cell, for example, and you can't find the prevalence of it that you need in the UK. Then there may be grounds there to do those clinical trials in a foreign jurisdiction. I think the key thing worth noting as well is that clinical trials are allowable up to stage three, broadly speaking. Stage four tend to be ineligible. In terms of the intensive rate, I think Max has highlighted how big of a difference this can make. I think the key thing is that the assessment needs to be made in a timely way and needs to be done properly, because if you're making this assessment that you're going to be an intensive R&D claimant, it's likely that HMRC will be reviewing it in order to gain some certainty to avoid people manipulating their costs. Uh, other areas, pure mathematics. So with the increased prevalence of machine learning and AI, there's more likely to be development of data models and of statistical analysis. And that's where you may see more R&D costs for life sciences clients. And then in terms of data and cloud computing costs, uh, cloud computing storage costs for image-driven companies will be of particular relevance. So interaction with things like PAC systems or with DICOM protocols, particularly important, and subscriptions to things like LCMS. Uh, libraries, again, could be areas where there's significant data costs. We move on to the next slide. So in terms of the regime, we've already had a significant amount of change to the regime, but there is likely to be more going forward. So currently under consultation is a merging of the two regimes into a single regime, although it's not quite a single regime because the intensive intensive R&D regime will still, do, still be under the SME. Um, in terms of what they're aiming to do, they're aiming to simplify things notionally. However, there's significant questions over whether that will take place. So the issues that we see are particularly with reference to things like subcontracted costs and subsidies. Uh, and they may have a significant negative impact for life sciences companies, particularly CROs. I, if you are being engaged to undertake R&D on another company's behalf, you may well lose the ability to claim altogether. Grant funded products, projects are also a risk uh, and they may be lost as well going forward. The regime itself is designed to be like the RDEC regime, so an above the line tax credit. And currently they're talking about a rate of 20%, which is the current RDEC rate. However, if you put this in some context, last week Ireland increased their rate to 30%. So there are questions over how competitive we will remain if we don't increase our rate alongside changing it to a single regime. We move on to the next slide. Just some risks and opportunities worth mentioning. So it feels like there's been a lot of doom and, doom and gloom with regards to the way in which I've described the changes to the regime. The regime is still actively encouraged by the government and it also leads to significant cash inflows. So there is still a benefit to claiming. It's also worth noting that if you're looking for an exit, R&D may be taken into account when deciding the price of the company, but you need to gain some comfort over how likely you are to gain that amount and what that amount is likely to be. The key risk is clearly that the claim might be materially wrong, particularly given the new regime requirements. This can impact tax position, it can impact audit accounts, the audit of the accounts, and it can also impact the valuation of the company. In terms of other key areas, fines, penalties, and repayments of Previous claims are something that we're seeing increasingly within the regime. That is a huge, huge risk to companies, not only in life sciences, but in other sectors. And I think the other key issue is with regards to these inquiries that Max talked about. They're becoming increasingly onerous and the results, as Max alluded to, are becoming increasingly negative, even if you have had many years of successful claims in the past. Moving on to the final slide in terms of how RSM can help. So I think the first thing is the scoping. And that's making sure you understand what's required and that both parties are able to make informed decisions. In terms of reviewer claims, ensuring that claims are to the extent possible risk mitigated is absolutely key. Uh, we're also able to help with fully outsourced claims. So that means doing a lot of the work ourselves. Um, that's becoming increasingly popular with the change in the regime because uh, companies aren't as certain as to how to put together their new claims. Pattern boxes of increasing importance. So allowing you to pay your corporation tax at 10% rather than a new rate of 25%. This is extremely immaterial. So uh, definitely worth investigating if you hadn't considered it in the past, but bear in mind, this is for profit making companies. Uh, in terms of technical assessments, this is a key area that you should be looking to get advice on. So things like your ability to claim within the intensive regime, uh, 
mitigating any risk of exceeding that 7.5 million euro limit, and also whether you are able to claim for some of those overseas costs should be areas which are assessed in detail and you get an opinion on, because as I said, they're likely to be challenged, if anything, by HMRC. And finally, the key, it's key that you work collaboratively with any agent you're working with uh, in order to improve process going forward and to make sure that you understand the risks and are able to mitigate them to the extent possible. I think we've got a few minutes for Q&A, so are there any other questions either in the room or online, Phil? So if anyone online has any questions, do feel free to put them in the chat now. Um, if not, we'll well give it give it 30 seconds and then, then we can move on. That's fine. I think just coming back to what Max said about inquiries, HMRC are becoming really, really, really difficult to work with right now. So it, I think the key thing is to prevent the inquiry from taking place. Now is the time to, to do or spend more time and effort on getting your documentation right, making sure that it's in order <clears throat> with a particular focus for life sciences businesses on the quality of the narratives and on making sure that you're not including costs that don't meet the requirement or are in the wrong category. So where in the past HMRC may have asked for your overall levels of expenditure, they're now digging in and asking for things like invoices, contracts. So all of those things you need to be able to produce if you want to make a claim. So, Carl, we've got one question online. So it, it is R&D CapEx included in the 40% spend limit for intensive companies? I think it's going to be cost hitting the P&L. So it depends what your, if it's capitalised expenditure, my assumption would be that it wouldn't hit the P&L, mm -hmm. so it should be excluded. Okay. Do you need section 138? Yeah, is anything, is anything deductible in your corporate tax return? So if you have intangible fixed assets, so you capitalise development time, and it's deductible under a section 1308 claim, yeah. R&D, that should be fine. Yeah. Any tangible fixed assets will be included, uh, sorry, excluded. Yeah. So, so if you're a company that has been claiming R&D historically, and has made a section 1308 claim, which if you don't know what that is, have a look at your tax return, and it should be fairly clear. Uh, but it, it, in effect, where you've got capitalised R&D, which um, does qualify or would have qualified had it not been capitalised, then the Section 138 claim reverses that um, and, and allows you to, to include it within your R&D calculation. So I think the expectation is that 40% will include those costs. Um, all right, any other questions? Nothing coming through online. Um, so do we move on to the next session? Yeah, Phil, I think we're back, we're bang on time, so we'll pass over to you. Thanks. Brilliant. Um, so for those that have joined after the intro, um, I, I would have been there in person, but unfortunately I've got COVID, um, so that's why I'm dialing in, and that's why occasionally I might suddenly mute if I go into a coughing fit, um, but we'll try and avoid that. Um, so before I sort of get into looking at US expansion, um, either if you're in the room or if you're online using the React, um, I think it's the React icon, which you should see at the top, um, can it get a, a sort of a show of hands or thumbs up as to how many people are already doing business in the US? So a few people in the room and a few thumbs up coming through. Um, and if you're not already doing business in the US, is it is it an area that you are looking at? So again, thumb, hands up or thumbs up online. OK, good. So I just effectively, I'm trying to gauge you know, uh, the, the level of, of interest in the US, because my assumption is most life science businesses are always going to be doing something in the US, whether that's going out and, and um, uh, you know, accessing talent there um, from a perspective of development or whether it's asset accessing the market because it is one of the biggest markets that, that many biotechs eventually will look at. Um, so if you want to move on to the next slide, please, Sandy. 
Um, so why do companies look at the US? And, and I guess I should say, you know, why why am I sitting here as a UK person telling you about the US? So I, I've I've been working with businesses for many years who've been expanding out in the US. And as I said at the intro, um, I used to work for a tech business um, that had expanded into the US and I went and lived there for a few years. So at one point I was very averse in all the details of US tax. Um, and then I came back and Trump um, got in and changed lots of the rules. So I still have an awareness of all of the rules. Um, and very much I act as a as a filter for colleagues in RSM US um, to, to do the sort of the detailed stuff on, on um, US taxes. But I spend a lot of time, probably, you know, three, four, five conversations a week with businesses on what do they need to think about when they're going out into the US. Um, so, so that's that's why you've got a UK person talking to you about US taxes um, and expansion. So sort of as a starting point, it's always like interesting to think, why do companies want to move into the US? Um, so a, a list there, which I think are all relevant um, to uh, life science businesses, um, you know, I, I think the, the the key ones for me there is probably the market expansion and also the the search for talent um you know I, a, a lot of my clients uh within life sciences sector they will go out into the us particularly there are certain areas within the us where you know, they are attracting cc c suite talent and that might be um in terms of more the, the technical side so you, t you know ctos etc um but but that is one reason why people want to go out into the us um I think if we move on to the next slide um now once a company has decided it wants to go to the us then it's it's almost that sort of okay at what point do we need to worry about it um now if i'm a uk business and i'm selling into the us um which appreciate for sort of earlier stage uh, life science businesses that might not be an issue um but you know if if you're partnering with people in the us or you are starting to, to um receive income from the US or you know I've got clients who are still relatively early stage but they have started selling into the US um, it might be that you're caught uh, in the UK by US sales taxes um, and you know without teaching you to suck eggs but you know just to sort of go back to basics what are US sales taxes it's a bit like VAT but not quite the same but it is a sort of end tax so if and, and where this issue came from was something called the Wafer case. And what effectively happened was one particular state realized that people were selling from outside of their state into their state. And because they were registered in states that didn't have sales tax, they weren't charging sales tax in their state. So this particular state, in its view, was losing out on cash. They took it to court, they won, and they got to the point where if you were selling into their state above a certain threshold, you'd have to register for sales tax in their state. Of course, US being the US, all these other states went, that's a great way of raising re revenues for our state. So they all started doing it. And the, the sort of the end story is that if you're selling into the US from outside of a state and the UK is outside of a US state, then you are caught by sales taxes. Now, in the vast majority of cases, if you're a UK business selling into the US, you probably won't have to charge sales tax unless you're selling direct to consumer, but not necessarily relevant for, for a life science business. However, that doesn't mean that there isn't a compliance obligation. Um, and why is it important to sort of think through that? So if I'm a UK business and I've already thought about I'm going out into the US and, uh, and, and that I need to think about at what point do I deal with the US, it might be that I'm already caught by these, this compliance burden. And if I'm already caught by this compliance burden, then often that's a, a sort of catalyst for trying to expedite. Do I need to set something up there or not? Um, so if I've got something in the US already, sorry, if I've, if I've got sales tax exposures or compliance burdens, do I deal with it as my UK company or do I deal with it um, through, through potentially setting something up? That's the first point. Um, second point that, that often um, clients uh, ask me about is, you know, if I just set up through an employer of record, um, 
which is uh, in, in effect a, th a third party who takes on the uh, legal obligation of employing the individuals, um, but they are effectively working for my business. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that you know all is done and I don't need to worry about it? Um, potentially is the answer. Um, very much depends on what the individuals are doing for your business. But, but broadly, once you get to the point where you've got a senior person out there and they are representing your business doing something for you in the US, then the chances are you need to go a stage further and not just have um, an employee of record, but think about creating a, um, a, a legal entity. Um, and then the last point there um, is you know, a commercial partner or customer you know, would need you to, to have a US entity. So um, for those of you that are already in the US, um, you will know that US people like to do business with US um, clients. And, and, you know, reading between the lines, that's often because they want to have someone that you can sue if it goes wrong. Um, you know, that's the way of, of the US world. So often um, it gets to the point where it doesn't matter whether you actually need a, a, a US entity from your own perspective, it's more the customers are driving it and they say, well, we want to do business with the US entity. If you want to do business with us, um, you have to set something up. Um, so, so they're often the, the, the times at which I need to think about, OK, I need to do something. Um, what do I need to do? And that gets us into um, our next slide, if we can move on, um, which is what's the typical process of setting up? Um, now, based on you know, years of experience, it, it is not the most um, simple um, to set up a US business. Um, there is a process involved and there is a timeline involved. Um, it's not, not quite as easy as it is in the UK. Um, but your first step is you'll always need a lawyer to do the legal documentation and the incorporation. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and and that's and that's so you know, uh, in the UK, for example, um, you know RSM could help a company with its sort of company secretarial type activities. In the US, um, uh, pro professional services are very much split. Accounting firms cannot do legal work. Um, legal work can cannot do accounting work. So you'll always need that that lawyer involved. Um, and the next sort of step is what is the structure now? There are lots of different types of legal entities in the US um, and I've been in many and many discussion on what should the right entity be and the end result is always it's a Delaware C Corp. Now from a US tax perspective there are various nuances in the tax treatment of different entities. From a UK perspective in order for that the tax treatment of, a, of an entity in the US to be similar in tax treatment to a, a limited company in the UK, we'd always want to get to it being a C Corp. And then in terms of where does that get located, it can be set up in different places, but typically you end up with Delaware because it has almost the, the most simple form of simple type company's house regime. Um, so if, if you are ever getting to the point where you're setting something up and um, there are discussions around different types of entities, and someone says, um, we need to charge you lots of money to do some analysis to get to the right type of entity. The chances are you don't need to do that and you can end up with a Delaware C Corp. But if you are getting um, proposals to do lots of analysis, um, speak to me and we can have an offline discussion about that. Um, so you get to the point where you've got your entity, you know what your entity needs to be set up. Um, the, in, the incorporation documents um, and registration with the state are done. Um, so you've got, in effect, a shell entity set up, as I said, hopefully in, in Delaware. Before that entity can then do anything in the US, before it can open a bank account, before it can take on employees, before it can register with an employer record, it needs to have a tax identification number. Um, and that that is almost like the gateway for that entity to be able to do anything. Um, and there's this, this is a bit, well, it's, it's, it always makes me smile when I talk about this, but th there's a quick way of doing it and there's a long way of doing it. If um, you have a US person who becomes, in effect, the responsible party for that entity, and that's um, uh, basically defined as the person who, if you were to sub submit a tax return for this US entity, that would be the person who would be signing off 
um, as, as the signatory on the tax return. Um, if you have that US person and they have their social security number, then the process of getting a tax ID number is about 15 minutes because you do it all online, you press a button and it comes back. If you don't have that person with a US social security number and therefore you've got an officer of the company who might be a UK company, you have to fill in a form and you have to fax it to the IRS. Um, which, as I say, that always makes me smile that I talk about fax machines. Um, but that is the process and it hasn't changed in decades. Um, and if you have to, if you don't have that person with a US social security number and you're faxing it, then um, it can be anything from two to 10 weeks for the EIN to come back. Um, I've, I've certainly seen ones recently in a couple of weeks, but I've also seen ones that have taken months. And it very much depends on where does that fax um, get picked up, who picks it up and which, how busy is the office that's doing it. Um, so it, it is something to factor into your um, setup. If you do have investors or um, uh, people who are part of the business and maybe those who you're thinking about employing, you know, to come up with an arrangement where they can um, be employed, well, not employed, but be an officer of the company pending employment to get their social security number can get things moving quicker. Um, moving forward, if you've got that sorted, then it's down to sorting out your bank account and payrolls and insurance. Now, bank account, US banking is very much relationship driven. So if you're a small um, business and you're just starting out, it can be quite hard. Um, the advice I usually give is um, if you're banking with someone in the UK who has a US presence, then lean on that relationship heavily. If you don't have, um, if your UK bank uh, banking um, counterparties don't have a, a, a US operation, mm -hmm. then find one that does. Um, and, and it's worth the time investing up front in having those discussions with your um, banks in, in order to um, speed that process up. Um, I've seen some companies get bank accounts within a month. I've seen some companies struggling six months later to, to open a US bank account. Um, there are ways and means if you're only just starting out and it's more about getting making sure you can pay people, then you know the equivalent of a sort of Revolut type account, um, you know, an online account where you can still um, make it look like well, it, it is connected to your US entity, but it's not your sort of typical um, bank account. Um, but so so there are ways around it, but it just does take time. Um, then payroll, I mentioned employer of records already. Um, it is um, quite um, you know, well trodden path for a, once you've got your US entity is to initially use an employer of record. Um, typically, if you've got sort of between one and five people, um, the economics of it work out OK. Um, but as as you may or may not know, the, the US, um, the, the way that they and deal with payroll and all the things that a company has to deal with in terms of compliance, all the different types of taxes and benefits that have to be provided, uh, you know, Medicare, et cetera, et cetera, um, just mean that setting up payroll yourself, which you may do if you're a small business in the UK, um, it, it's just a lot harder. Um, and there's so many more pitfalls and penalties for getting it wrong that it's just not worth trying to, to go it alone yourself. So, as I say, an employer of record for a small number of people works out well. Um, if you're getting beyond that, then it's it may become more co um, costly because of the employer of record takes a percentage of everyone's salary or, uh, or the total costs of remuneration. Um, and then it might get to the point where you need to have your to go through a payroll provider. Um, there are lots and lots of options available at that point. Um, as a UK company going out to the US, I usually say you know, go for one of the um, more recognised um, payroll providers simply because you don't want the hassle of having to piece everything together yourselves. I have seen companies in the past who have gone for, you know, they found a, a a payroll provider and then they found an, someone else who does benefits and they found someone else who does uh, the insurance and and they've end up messing it all up because they've tried to sort of go it cheap by picking and choosing different providers often it's just better 
um, say saves l less risky and saves money in the long run to just find one of the, the bigger providers. Um, moving on to the next slide. Um, so uh, lots of processes to go through to set up um, and then just a quick overview here of, of what what it is going forward you have to sort of deal with as a UK business with a, a US subsidiary. Um, so it is more complicated in the UK in terms of the overall tax regime. Um, and what you'll find is um, as you're, you, when you're eventually dealing with um, US uh, tax advisors is you'll have a different person or people who will specialise in each of this, these areas. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and therefore you're, it, it won't be unusual if you were to have a call with the, uh, a US advisor, whether it's RSM or others, that you'll have you know, a conversation with several people on a call um, whereas in the UK, we t we tend to be, you know, we have people like myself who are very much generalists and can cover lots of different topics. That's not the way the US works. So just to, to pre-warn you that you, if you're having calls with advice in the US, you will have lots of people on the call. Um, but it, it's, you know, the, 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 they're all doing the right thing. Um, so in terms of what, what you're uh, having to think about, you've got federal and state taxes. So federal is tax across the entire US, irrespective of where you are. State is is the the tax in which you're subject to in the specific states in which you have a presence. Um, now, some um, clients often say to me, "Well, we're setting up in the U.S. I've heard that Florida's got a really low state tax rate, so I want to set up in Florida." And I'm like, that's fine. Are your people going to be based in Florida? No, they're all going to be based in in um, Boston. Okay, so you you can't get into the state tax regime in Florida unless you've got a presence there. Um, and, and broadly, when we talk about a presence, we're talking about um, people, property or sales. Um, so wherever you have um, those three things, that is going to drive the states in which you're subject to tax. Uh, and, and the reality is that you need to look at where, the, where your business is going to be and how your, your business is going to be, be structured on a day to day basis. And that should drive um, where you're potentially subject to state taxes. If you can make subtle chain, subtle decisions around where people are located or where your offices are located, then then great. But but don't be trying to to play the state system and trying to get into states uh, with lower state taxes, be, um, where you're going to have people in other states because you're going to get caught by those other states. Um, sales taxes we've already touched on, so I, I won't go through that. And, and payroll taxes, uh, as I say, very complicated. Um, lots of things that need to go. Um, go into um, paying an individual over and above um, what, you, what you might think of in the UK. Um, anecdotally, I was at a presentation by a, an, um, a, a, an employer of record a, a few months ago, and, and they'd done some analysis that effectively said if uh, they were looking at a different sector, but they said if you had a software mm -hmm. engineer in the UK who you might be paying 60 or 70,000 to, inclusive of all the taxes etc that you'd have to pay in the UK the equivalent in the US might cost you upwards of 150 160 thousand dollars and and that part of that was um the uplift in difference in salaries but a significant part of it was also the difference in the number of um, taxes and additional costs that the company would have to bear from having that individual um, so, you know, not to scare you, but it is it is more expensive and um, to, to take people on in the US. Um, so they're, they're the sort of the three main areas of tax um, that as a company you'd have to think about. And then the other areas, you know, as you'd expect with any international expansion, you've got transfer pricing. So where are the profits, um, tax and profits arising between the UK and, and the US? Um, and you also have to think about thing, things like the withholding taxes out of the US to the extent you're bringing cash back. Um, next slide. Um, so I, I appreciate a very quick canter through setting up the US, uh, a US entity, why you might need to, to think about and when to worry about it. Um, and also the, the, the types of taxes that um, you might have to think about once you're there. Um, Typically, what I do, I said at the outset, I have sort of three, three, four, five conversations of this a week. Um, it's very much sort of 
working out within your UK business what it is that you're trying to do and achieve in the US and then um, bringing in um, my colleagues in the US at the right time to to open that conversation out as to, to what it is that you need to do specifically in the US and and you know working working with your lawyers or um, uh, or, or those that we've worked with in the past um, just to really sort of help you from a UK context make sure that you can set up in the US uh, in a sensible way and it's not um, uh, you know, overburdensome because it, it it can be a challenge because it is such a complicated place to do business um, but with the right sort of experience and hand holding through it then it, it, it is possible and it can be done and it can be done in a way that you can look back and go oh you know that wasn't as painful as I thought it was going to be um, and that's certainly when you know if I could go back 10 years when I first started looking at stuff in the US it was painful but now I've done it so many times it's not as painful and it kind of all makes sense and you can kind of work out how it all fits together but that's that's the, the, the sort of service um, that we offer um, and always very happy to have you know a, an hour-long chat with, uh, with with you about your specifics um, so I will pause there um, and look at the questions. Um, and so Phil, we, we do have two outstanding questions from the R and D section. If you're okay to cover them, um, I, I I will I will do. Um, Thank you. Just on the US stuff. Any questions in the room or online? That would be a no. Um, so going back to the questions online, which I think are uh, relation to the R and D. So um is lab rent under a lease a qia it's an interesting question so i think this comes from people reviewing the, the bis guidelines and seeing qia costs as being lab rental uh, yeah lab rentals what, what that's referring to is the time spent on printing labs as opposed to the cost of lab rental itself so rental costs generally aren't allowable within the regime Pretty straightforward answer to that one, I hope. Which might also answer the other question, which is along a similar theme. So, are lab costs used by our US subsidiary but paid by a UK parent claimable? Uh, it depends what. So, lab costs are pretty general. If it means lab rental, then you know, mm -hmm. it still would meet the requirements of the UK regime. If it means other labor laboratory costs, so there can be various consumables, there can be energy costs, and those costs hit a UK PL, yes. Up until accounting period started on or after the first of April 24, you should still be able to claim for those costs if they're hitting that UK PL. Oh so yeah, yes, they should be. <clears throat> so it depends which bits you're talking about. Okay, well, ho hopefully that's answered the, the the individuals that have those questions online. Um, and if there are no questions about the US, um, I say very happy to. Um, pick up afterwards um, or email me privately um, and we can pick those up. Um, if not, then uh, Cos, do you want to handle this slide? Uh, if you want to uh, sign up for RSM Insights, I think there's a QR code there which should hopefully work. Um, mine tends to pop up whenever I put my phone on, so uh, shouldn't be a problem there. And there are various preferences with regards to receiving information from RSM. We try and make sure that all of our clients are kept up to date with current affairs in, in all of the major areas they request information on. So really, really useful tool. I've, I've spoken to people today who, who haven't been kept up to date with things which might be particularly relevant for them going forward. So it's a nice thing to have, even if you're not using our services necessarily. Uh, and those are all our contact details. So. Max, Bill and I are always available for a conversation. Um, we don't charge for those initial conversations. We can't charge for the, the, the kind of scoping discussions. Generally speaking, we want to understand what you're doing and see if we can help in some way, shape or form. Excellent. And, and now I think over to Sarah from Charles Russell Speech, please. Yeah, thank you. Just, Sandy, if you want, I'm putting our slide deck up, that'd be fab. Or not. There we go. There you go. 
There we go. Hi. Um, so Caroline and I are here today to um, talk about a couple of different things. Um, I'll be covering um, quite high level terms, different types of equity investment, um, how to prepare for that investment and some of the kind of company law best practice areas um, you might need to, you will need to follow if you're going to take investment on or um, undertake an IPO, which I was talking to a couple of about um, before the session started. And then um, Caroline, who is an absolute expert on all things IP, she's going to talk to you about um, how you create IP, really importantly for you guys, how you then protect that IP and some of the common pitfalls um, in contracts and how you define that IP and how different types of IP interact with one another. So if we can ping forward a couple of slides, please, Sandy, that'd be great. And one more. Thank you. Um, so. Um, this is going to be quite high level and I'm really conscious that we've got people in the room and, and online who are at different stages of their um, growth. Um, so apologies if this is super simple or if it's not detailed enough, but you've got our details on the slides, which you will have access to any questions afterwards or in the room. Just give us a shout. Um, so really simply, what is equity investment? Um, equity investment is, is where um, somebody puts capital, puts funding into, into a business in exchange for shares in that business, a chunk of a chunk of the action. Um, uh, it's um, opposed to raising money by way of, of debt. Um, there's different types. So um, on the on the right hand side of the slide there, you've got different type or the different kind of stages of investment that you would expect um, from, from startup all the way through to PE. So your angel investors, um, that's your initial seed money. That can come from friends and family. A lot of the time, depends on who you know. <laughs> I wouldn't be asking my friends and family for it, but, you know, there you go. Um, so, and, or it can be high net worths. Um, it can even be crowdfunding. And we know that quite a lot of um, life sciences business in particular are going for crowdfunding at the moment. Um, with angel investments, the, the sums are, are quite small. You know, you'd be getting five, 10, 15 grand here and there and in exchange for that the investors require very little you know just chuck them a set of accounts every now and again and they're and they're quite happy next step as you grow is um, venture capital and there are lots of venture capital houses um, spread across lots of them obviously based in London um, that's for um, investment for early stages so a, a bit more than what you get out of your seed investors out of your angel investors um, they're looking for innovative businesses strong pipeline you can see where the growth is going to be. VC is very um, common in um, in the life sciences sector. Um, and uh, as you will see that as you kind of get further down the investment line, the investors want a little bit more for their money. <laughs> so a little bit more involvement in the business, a little bit more decision making powers potentially um, and and more on the exit. Um, and then you also have then the next stage is, is private equity. And you'll have PE houses that will um, go, for, you know, some PE houses that will specialise in 10, 15 million pound worth investors, all the way up to, you know, the big, the big, big money. Um, and the PE houses tend to have uh, an exit strategy of between four, five, six, seven years. So they want to get a return in that time. Um, they will want far more involvement in the business. Um, so, you know, you can see that as a, a good or a bad thing. Um, why would you consider it equity investment? Well, in the short term, it's cheaper than debt. So because there's no interest rates that attach to it. Um, and so from a from a cash flow perspective, it's cheaper than debt or um or quasi debt. So I was talking to Emma earlier about convertible loan notes. So convertible loan notes are a form of debt instrument. Um, that when the maturity date hits, the loan note holder can convert that into equity. So if you don't want somebody taking a chunk of your business, you 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 kind of buy that buy that CLN out before it converts. Um, so equity is cheaper in the short term than debt. Um, you can get it if you've got a particular concept that you want to develop and you think, okay, I've got it's a really this is a sexy idea. Someone's bound to want to invest into this then you can go and um, get out and get your equity funding. Um, if you've got really impressive growth plans, and so it's not for a particular product, but it is just generally we know organic growth isn't quite enough for us. Um, we know our business plan is really ambitious, but we're going to need a big injection of cash to do that. 
Um, that's what VC houses and PE houses love because it sees quite a quick turn on their money. Um, but also equity, um, equity investment, particularly at VC and PE level, um, often comes with um, a level of expertise. So the PE houses in particular will want their own people on the board. And those people will have industry expertise. They'll have loads of contacts. Think Dragon's Den, that's what you're getting. You're buying Peter Tall Chap or Theo Fajitas, whatever his name is. You're you're getting them in, in with the in with the package. Um, so it kind of gets you the expertise. So if you are a what I have found with quite a number of life sciences um clients is they're excellent scientists, they're great mathematicians, they're brilliant in terms of we know what we want to do to make a difference to the world but they're not hugely business savvy. And so the, you know, the growth strategy and how you do that isn't, isn't second nature to them. That's what equity investment can bring you. It can bring you that kind of that business element that is sometimes lacking. Next slide, please, Sandy. So how do you prepare for equity investment? I mean, how do you prepare for anything? You have to, you have to be detailed. You have to know what it is your business is and you need to have your housekeeping in order. And that's whether you're going for angel investment, VC, PE, or whether you're looking to IPO. Um, preparation and making sure your house is in order is absolutely crucial. Um, and one of the one of the key things that is often kind of left to the wayside is the real um, uh, making sure that your documentation is in place. I would say that I'm a lawyer, so I love documents. I'm making sure that they do what they say they do. I love it, but making sure that you have that your contracts are watertight. Caroline will come to it, making sure that you own the IP, that you know if you're a business and your employees are creating that IP, make sure it belongs to the business and not to that person. Um, all of that good stuff, making sure that your lease documents say what they need to say so that when an investor comes in, they know they're investing into something that is sustainable and that is low risk. Um, taking early advice on um, corporate and tax structuring, RSM are you guys for the tax piece, obviously, um, but for your corporate structure, and we we frequently work with with um, uh, companies like RSM to make sure that all the bits talk together to make sure that the corporate piece, whether it's setting up in the US or whether it's building the right corporate structure here, make sure that works for you in terms of your long term plans. We see lots of people who set up on day one really, really simply like I'm just going to take a shelf company here and that's fine because it's just me and my mate. So, well, if you already know that you're going to do X, Y, and Z, what you do now might impact on your ability to do X, Y, and Z in the future. So it's really important to have those ideas of future plans, whether you're whether you're already sizable and you have a future plan, look at your corporate structure now and see whether that makes sense. Um, review the share cap of your company and any subsidiaries. When somebody um, puts equity investment in, obviously the share capital, how that looks, how people share in the spoils of the business, that obviously changes. You know, people are going to get diluted down because more people are coming in and you have to share the pie. The pie has to go further. So make sure you have a clear understanding of what your share cap table looks like on as it is now, what it will look like fully diluted, what it would look like if you would convert loan notes, for example. Make sure everybody is aware of what those risks are and how the pie is going to be shared at the end. And hopefully it's a, it's a big pie. That's what we're all after. Um, and a, a, a key one, particularly in, in life sciences and with startups, is um, incentivizing your key people. Um, and any investor worth its salt will want to make sure that is done. They, you know, investors are very, very happy to make sure that there's a pot allocated for the talent, because particularly in, in your world, that's that's where the value is. Right. It's in the people who are coming up with these incredible ideas that that make incredible changes. So um, incentivizing your employees and your key members of management team with different kinds of share schemes. So you've got, you know, um, e EMI schemes that only apply to a certain to a certain point um, and growth shares and all of that good stuff that, again, RSM can help you with the valuations if you're going to um, the revenue to say we want to get clearance for this kind of share scheme that means our people are incentivized go to RSM, they'll tell you whether it's a runner or not, and then come to us and we'll put it in place for you, essentially. And next slide, please. And then just company law best practice. Again, 
you know, it might seem very dry and it's often some of the things that get pushed to one side because you've set up your business and everyone's doing what they should be doing. But there are some some, some admin that needs to be taken care of. So um, the first one is keeping your statutory books. Um, really, really, really simple. But the amount of times we have people coming to us who are seeking investment or are at the stage of listing even and their stat books for the whole of the group aren't up to date. So that is your register of directors, who your directors are, what their addresses are, what other directorships they hold, your register of members, um, you know, who your shareholders are, when they got their shares, what they paid for their shares and if those shares are paid up. That's one of the key things that often happens for us is that you find out that no one's actually paid for the shares that they have. Right. <laughs> so obviously not when investors come in because you've got the investment money. But when you're at that beginning stage where you're getting money from friends and family, no one's actually paid for the shares. Everyone's just been promised a chunk. And then they're, you know, they're on companies' houses owning shares, but they don't actually haven't paid for them yet. So make sure that is done um, and registers of any mortgages or anything like that you've got. And there's also the, um, the, the requirements to disclose information at companies' house, just as with every other regime that we've got at the moment, are getting more and more and more and more onerous and stringent. So make sure that you, you tick the boxes and keep ticking those boxes every year. Because if you don't tick the boxes, you are struck off. The company is struck off. And companies have to do that a lot. Um, if you've got multiple shareholders, even if it's just a couple of people or a few people, have a shareholders agreement. Um, we have people come to us far too late in the game when people have fallen out. And it's like, well, what do we do with the shares? Johnny's not pulling his weight anymore. It's like, well, you can't force him to sell his shares. So you're stuck with Johnny and Johnny has a right to be on the board. So what do you do? So best thing to do is early stages when everyone's really friendly and everyone's all hopeful for the future. We will put in place that shareholders agreement that says, well, we're the harbingers of doom. If it doesn't work out, this is how we will manage it. And it's best to have those conversations while everyone is still friends. Um, keep copies of everything. Um, all of your contracts, keep it in keep it in order because whether you're getting an investment in or you're going to IPO, if you're going to IPO, you have a prospectus that needs to be verified. Every single word of that prospectus needs to be checked by a lawyer and verified that it is true before it can be signed off and go to market. And if an investor's coming in, they'll have their own lawyers pouring over everything you have. Um, and finally, we'll take advice before you start messing around with your share cap. Um, table and your share capital before you get investment in. There's lots of procedures in the Companies Act that need to be followed um, to before you can, you know, start changing your share capital. Um, for us, it's everyday stuff, but it's really easy to miss some of the really simple boxes. We've had to go to court for clients who have not done that properly, and it has held up investments by months and months because you have to go to court to say, sorry, we didn't do that quite right. Um, and it's not cheap. And it's just a faff. No one cares about this kind of stuff. It's really dry, you know. But if it's the thing that's stopping your investment, you'll care about it very quickly. Um, so just very conscious because I know that Caroline's got the far more interesting bit on the IP stuff. But that is the quickest, um, you know, different stages of investment, what you need to do. Because if I had to go deeper into any of these, that would be an hour in itself. Um, and it's more just a pleasure to, to meet everybody. But any questions now or afterwards, just, just give us a shout. Any questions from your side, Phil? Anything come in? And we're still okay for time. So, Caroline, no need to rush through. Yeah, yeah. We're still okay for time. No problem. Okay. So, I am, yes, as Sarah said, as everybody said, talking about IP, which I think in this sector in particular is crucial. Um, you all know that. Um, I think we're, we're framing it kind of off the back of what Sarah's been talking about and getting your house in order but not waiting for that point when you are looking for investment or you're looking to or whatever it might be, doing it as a matter of course from day one. And appreciate you're all at very different stages in the businesses and you will have very different roles. Um, so coming at this from a legal lens, which hopefully you will at least be able to filter through to your teams um, if you're not the right person. So go on to the first slide. So, and there's a lot of text on here because hopefully these, these slides will hopefully be quite handy and please do share them in your organizations. Um, we've had a lot of clients really benefit from just quite the simplicity of, of, of the basic rules that we're going to talk about um, around IP and it's always a surprise to us 
how even very, very um, well-educated, um, really experienced businesses don't understand the basic principles around IP and particularly ownership. So general rule around intellectual property is the author or the inventor, depending on what type of IP we're talking about, um, is the first owner. That's different where you have employees, employees, and I'm sure you all know this, but IP, certainly under English law, created in the course of employment or through duties specifically assigned to you, automatically vest and belong to the employer. So it's very straightforward. If you have an employment scenario in diligence, particularly where we have corporate transactions, if the answer is everything was created by employees through the English company in the course of their employment, it's a relief because it's really straightforward. Um, the one thing I would say is employment contracts are there for a reason. You will know not just to rely on the position under English law, you will know that employee employment contracts should have comprehensive IP clauses. The basic rule under English law is very simple. That That is it. You want to know there's an obligation on the employees to notify you of what they're creating, to keep it confidential, to um, have further assurance clauses in there, to ensure that it's if they've done it jointly or with other, you know. So you have to go further than just what's under English law, but it's a nice safety blanket to have that your position is protected under, under English law, like I say. This is the one that, um, people come up with. So contractors, and that is essentially any third party to your business. So could be a supplier you engage, could be a consultant, could be a sole trader, could be a joint venture, could be uh, an R&D partner, collaborator, any third party to your business. If they are creating IP for you, it will remain their property, even if you pay for it. And the amount of people that think, but I paid for this IP, I own it, it's all great. That's not the case. Under English law, in order to legally own title to intellectual property, you have to have obtained a written assignment from the from the designer, from the author, whoever it might be, from that contractor, in order to transfer ownership to you as the commissioner of the works. And that this goes, it's a basic rule, but this, this kind of infiltrates, you've got manufacturing relationships, licensing relationships, JVs, all those sorts of things, where IP is supposed to be owned somewhere else. You need to have those words on the page. You need to have the written assignment. There are... Um, essentially formalities under English law, that unless you have that, you end up with either an implied license to use the IP they've created for you, which arguably is terminable on reasonable notice, which you don't want. There's also questions as to the scope of that license. Is it exclusive to you? Is it non-exclusive? Can they share it with other people? All things which you want to completely avoid in intention, particularly if the shared intention is you own it, then make sure you own it. And the number of contracts we review where people think they own it, they think the wording's right, and it's not. It's a really simple thing, but if you get it wrong, it can cause huge problems. It's also, like Sarah was saying, a lot harder to deal with retrospectively because you may not have the relationship with the contractor anymore, and you may have fallen out with them. So then try and obtain a legal assignment post, it's, it's a lot harder. So getting that into your contracts as a matter of course is, is really important. From an investor perspective as well, the implied license is an absolute yeah. no-go. It, it doesn't market. give them the certainty enough for it. So if that's all, all that you have, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a red flag in our report to the investor. Flag. Yeah. And normally they would want to get some sort of confirmatory assignment. If you've got overseas contractors mm -hmm. in the UK company, that obviously could apply. Awesome. So the, the beauty, beauty and the complexity with IP is it's national. So this is English law. Even if you have something created by an overseas contractor, the local um, laws of their country will also govern the creation of that IP. So you can have a contract in place with them, and it's important that it's clear where the ownership lies and what happens. That's that's really important. But in Germany, for example, you can't assign IP. You can only waive it. So you might have a contract in place with a German contractor that says something, but it goes against German law principles. It's vulnerable to challenge. That's when you have and we'll come on to it. Um, the wording we would always include, particularly where overseas individuals are involved or companies, is you assign it. That's the gold standard. If you can't assign it because a law in a foreign jurisdiction prevents it, you hold it on trust and you then grant an exclusive license to the organisation to ensure that individual, that, that contractor cannot license it elsewhere. So you basically have these kind of safety mechanisms to say, well, if the assignment didn't work because it's not enforceable under German law, as an example, then you rely on the on trust wording and also the exclusive license. So you end up with a nice chunky IP clause, but it gives you all the comfort you need. Um, I think the, the, that is one of the quirks with, and we have it a lot with transactions where individuals have been engaged, but they are all across the world. Then unfortunately you have to take into account those countries' um, rules and regulations around generation of IP. 
the one thing I would say is largely the rules are similar. It's a they own it unless you assign it. In the States, they have the work for hire, which is a bit different. Um, but we would always use that that wording um, and it kind of covers you for multi-jurisdictional work. Yeah, but I, I guess the, the point being there's don't think oh, we've got this one contract that we can roll out to everyone unless yeah, it's got completely. this all singing, all dancing, because... Yeah. Which people don't always want to use. Like we have, I'm sure you guys are similar, but like we've got, you have a short form IP clause, you have a medium form and you have a long form and you need to know which one is relevant and your teams need to know which one is relevant to be rolled out. Yeah, but just because you've had one ticked on day one yeah, does not mean that as your business has grown that that continues to be the right the right thing. Yeah. Um, joint IP is just something, particularly in this industry, we have a lot of clients in space who, who deal with a lot of joint IP and... The issue, whilst it all sounds very lovely and friendly to say, well, we'll jointly own whatever we create in this R&D space. And it's, it sounds really nice. But it's very difficult to actually manage and to go off and exploit the IP unless you have something in writing to deal with how that ownership works, how it's structured, who can do what. So in, in short, the position under English law is that jointly held IP, neither owner could do anything with it other than use it themselves. You can't exploit it other than yourself. You can't sell it, you can't grow up sub licenses to it. So it's, it's really restrictive. In America, it's different. It's very generous. You can kind of do whatever you want with it and nobody really minds. But in, Eng in Eng under English law, it's very restricted. So if you are anticipating joint IP, again, even just from an investment perspective, do you actually have the rights you need to go off and use that IP in the way you want to use it now and in the next 20 years? Um, so it's a case of making sure you've got clear ownership structure, who can and cannot um, uh, look to prosecute, so apply for um, patent protection, for example, who's going to enforce it, where are you going to be in, um, looking to seek protection, all those things in a contract. They should be in writing. Um, it's in relying on implied rights is impossible with, with joint IP. It's such a great area. This is, it's slightly nuanced to talk about joint IP and joint venture owned IP. So if you're in a joint venture that has its own corporate entity, which we see a lot of, the the IP that's created by the joint venture belongs to the joint venture. If it's a joint venture, yeah. If it's a, if it's a joint venture corporate, like if it's a company. corporate, yeah, yeah. Um, and we we um, have it a lot where the joint venture documentation talks about okay, what happens when we both leave this because it's not a joint venture forever. It's a joint venture for maybe fifteen years or a specific project. Then what happens once we wind all of this up? Then what happens to the IP and what are people's expectations? And again, it's one of those things like the shareholders agreement at the outset of a joint venture. People don't want to consider that, but it is absolutely crucial yeah. because the value in that, yeah. the value in the JV is in that IP. So how are people then going to divvy that up at the end of the at the end of the, yeah, the project? Yeah. Essentially? And also what happens if the corporate vehicle is actually being wound up or whatever? Yeah. How are you doing that? You've got to make sure that you're abiding by all the insolvency regulations, all those sorts of things. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Post termination, uh, the consequence of termination are key. Um, JV corporates. The one thing I would say is JV, we deal with a lot of JV agreements where it is you, you need that license in, so it needs to be expressly licensed in. Whereas if it was a corporate as part of the shareholders agreement, the JV agreement, you'd be agreeing that anything generated within the company is owned by the company. Um, could you go on to the next slide, Sandy, please? Thank you. I'm not going to go through all this. This is just a useful slide and it's kind of a summary. You will ho hopefully all know IP is not just this kind of bucket of just stuff it is disparate rights there is these are kind of the key different types of intellectual property rights um, this is recognized around uh, around the world you know this is not dissimilar so you have patents that are there to protect inventions you have copyright that's there to protect original works um trademarks your badge of origin badge of business the designs you can have registered and unregistered and then databases databases are becoming particularly important um and data is a huge asset in its own right, and it's hugely valuable to businesses. So people are paying a lot more interest in either ensuring that their database, in terms of the arrangement and the selection of that data, is protected by copyright, which arises automatically, um, or actually looking to protect the contents of the database um, through a database right. And there are nuances to each of these. There are exclusions to each of these. They last for different um, periods of time. Some of them you have to register, some of them you don't. I could go through that. This again is like an hour session on its own, just going through all of this in detail. This is a very quick snippet of everything. Um, but the most important thing I would say is when it comes to protecting your IP within your organizations, actually knowing what the IP is and being able to identify it. It's really important because people, the number of clients that we have to say, oh, yeah, I've got some copyright. 
And I'm like, that's not copyright in fact, actually that's a design or that's actually a trade or, and, and educating your teams on what is what is your first step because unless you have that it's impossible to actually try and protect it and to try to commercialize it you have to be able to understand what it actually is um okay so go on to the next slide these are just some steps which um i think in terms of that next step so you've identified what the ip is you can look at contractual mechanisms technical mechanisms behavioral mechanisms all three are crucial um, and this is really around you've created value your teams are working really hard with r d with respect to commercial, whatever it might be, generating hugely valuable intellectual property, what can you do to make sure you're actually protecting it? And you've obviously got registration processes, for some of those rights that arise automatically, but then looking at contractually, use those NDAs. They should be being used as a matter of course in your business when you start conversations with anybody to protect information. Involve your technical teams. We lawyers, whilst we love our jobs, we need to involve the technical and commercial teams when we're drafting contracts. It's impossible to protect the business without understanding what the tech is, what the business is, what the future goals are, what the strategy is, and actually that holistic view from all of the teams is fundamental. Um, tailoring the IP clauses, like Sarah just said, this goes for every type of IP clause. There is, not, there is no one size fits all. Um, carefully look at what your background IP is, what your foreground IP is, what you need to use the IP for if it's being generated by yourselves or by a counterparty. Then we'll come on to talk about licensing in a moment, but again, granting a license, people just think, yes, granted a license, lovely. There are so many words that follow that word, license, um, exclusive, non-exclusive, sole, sub-licensable, assignable, it could be time limited, it could be perpetual, it could be limited to a territory or field, field of use all things to think about what is appropriate and how are you how are you looking to commercialize but also to protect the value in your ip the one thing i would just say about um perpetual licenses is you, you often see the word that it's granted on a perpetual basis um perpetual under english law has two meanings when it comes to ip one is it's perpetual until terminated and if the termination provisions allow for the license to terminate it will terminate if you intend for the license to perpetual and survive termination has to be explicitly clear in the contract because otherwise it will terminate. Likewise with sub-licensable um, licenses, unlike just general contract or principles, unless you actually say the license is sub-licensable expressly in the contract, it will not be. Contract principles, that's not the case. You don't have to if you stay silent on it. It's implied that it is sub-licensable. It's not the same for IP. Um, it's just worth bearing that in mind. Um, just the time. So, uh, further assurance clauses are fundamental for all IP, um, all IP provisions. They look very boilerplate, but they're really important. You might need to rely on a third party to sign documents. Sounds silly, but very annoying when you come to a transaction and need somebody to sign a form and you can't get them. Um, if you're looking at third party IP, who is actually providing the assurances around it and ensuring you have a consistent approach to your contracts? Again, it sounds super simple, but unless you have that, you're not maintaining the value in the right, right way. Um, technical and behavioural. So technical is really simple measures, but actually ways in which you can implement security measures, make sure your staff are trained on it, access to the right people, disabling certain functions within all of your documentation, um, using source code repositories that are reliable. You know, all of these things, they, again, seem simple. We put them in contracts and we hope that they get they actually get in, um, put into practice. Delivery up obligations on termination. Is that actually being done? Those sorts of things. And actually just, just being mindful of um, what technical measures you're putting in place. And then behavioural, behavioral, lastly, this kind of thing and training and, and educating your staff at all levels, like I say, commercial, legal, te technical, whatever it might be, on, on all of this stuff. Um, be alert to where you're creating value. Audit trails are fundamental to demonstrating ownership, but then also further down the line to try to actually realise the value and commercialise. And then again, understanding the nature of confidential information, um, knowledge extraction, particularly in this sector, is really important. So you obviously have lots of um, knowledge in your minds. There are um, extraction exercises that people use to ensure your know-how is documented. That is invaluable. And without that, your staff will leave and that knowledge is lost. And it's very, um, it's always a massive concern for clients when that happens. Creating policies are another huge thing, um, becoming more and more um, important in the UK. And then, yeah, third-party involvement. So I'm aware I'm kind of whizzing through, but we've got a few minutes. So if we go on to the next slide, Sandy, thank you. Um, the last two slides are just kind of on the contractual provisions around IP. And these are just two examples of definitions. Now, these are um, transferable across all different types of contracts. And the distinction is background and foreground. So what do you each own as at the commencement date? Nice and simple. Uh, 
what do you own that is developed independently of a project, nice and simple, and then any improvements to that. That should be your background IP. You should retain that, whatever happens. That's pretty um, pretty well established and accepted. Foreground IP is the more tricky one. Um, so IP, foreground IP is generally seen as IP that's generated in the course of the project. Now with um, life sciences and, and this sort of sector, things like non-severable and severable foreground IP become really important because it's a how can you say that foreground IP is not linked so inextricably to background IP, as an example. So then you come up with these concepts of severable and non-severable, more definitions, more drafting, um, but all really important to ensure you know you've got clear scopes of who owns what, who's licensed to use what with respect to background and foreground. Um, I would just say avoid circular definitions. The number of times we see background IP excluding foreground IP, foreground IP excluding background mm -hmm. IP, that doesn't work. Only one can exclude the other. They can't both exclude the, um, each other. Um, and then if we go on to, I think it's the last slide, the last couple of minutes. And then this is just some kind of position. So once you've established a background IP, foreground IP, what do you need to do with it? Are those licenses to background IP specific to a project? Has it been incorporated into a product or a process that you need to be able to reuse post-project? Then that license needs to survive termination. And then foreground IP, do you each own what you create? Does one party own what the other creates? Is there an assignment to give effect to that? Um, you can also have licenses back. If one party is intended to own all the foreground IP, what does that license look like? Is it limited to the project? Does it go beyond the project? All of these things, which this is why you need those technical and commercial teams at that table with you to understand what they need to be able to do with it. Um, joint IP again, it's suitable in lots of circumstances, but what does it look like? How is it being used? And then lastly, just the most important thing, and I can't stress it enough, is all of this is wonderful, but unless you don't have a clause in that contract that says, to give a full effect to this position that we all agree on, we each assign whatever we need to assign to each other. That's really important. And then there's formalities under English law around assignment, and if you're executing something in the deed and all those sorts of things. And we can, like I say, this is a whistle-stop tour in 15 minutes, but each of these things is kind of like a half an hour session on its own. But would say is all of these concepts and principles are massively transferable across different types of contracts and it's so important in this sector and we've seen a lot of clients come unstuck where they haven't thought about it at the earlier stage um, and then trying to deal with it in, in that retrospect is really hard so yeah please do if you've got questions and that was the last yeah good just on time <laughs> sorry i know i was through the last um five ten minutes but um hopefully that, yeah it gives you a bit of a flavor of the kind of key things that we certainly advise on and, and look out for when it comes to to ip and commercializing it so we, had, we had one question um, on the online chat. So is English law vastly different to Scots law with respect to IP ownership? No, they're very similar. In fact, they're near identical, happily. <laughs> one of the rare occurrences where they are. Yeah, and, and <laughs> yeah, largely speaking that there are similarities kind of worldwide, but there are some jurisdictions where it's just a little bit different. I mean, they're the ones you just need to be careful of. Is that all the questions you've got, Phil? Uh, yes, that's it. Just being conscious of time, I, just time to wrap up for everyone. Uh, firstly, massive thank you to our friends at Charles Russell Speechleys for coming over and joining us in this presentation. A big thank you to Phil for joining, particularly given that he was on well, and to Ros and her team for uh, putting together the, the whole event. And uh, a thank you for everyone who's joined us today. Hopefully you've taken away some, some really, really interesting facts that you can use going forward. Uh, the key point from, from both our sides, ours and Charles Ross speech, please, please feel free to reach out to us if you've got any questions. We're more than happy to have discussions with you uh, and offer you uh, at least uh, somewhere you can bounce your ideas off of if you're not getting what you need from anywhere else. Okay. Definitely. So thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. Cheers, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.